Okay, well, um, despite the, um, the very kind introduction and uh, mention of Alzheimer's, I will not mention Alzheimer's at all. This is going to be about um, my research here on the campus. And um, I'm um, just a wee bit concerned. I, I really hope that um, I can uh, pitch this uh, right because I know there's uh, quite a variation in sophistication about biology. But um, so, you know, please uh, uh, stop me if it's um, getting a little too technical or, um, you know, present yourself with a bored expression if it's getting a little too easy. <laughs> um, so I'm, um, uh, so this is the title of the talk, Encoding Contingency in Multicellular Organisms. And I want to just um, sort of put it in a little background about how um, I arrived at this uh, uh, title. Uh, because, um, uh, and, and really start with this word contingency, which has a little bit of a, of an interesting history in biology um, that's more related to um, uh, um, larger scale evolutionary biology than what I'm mostly going to talk about today. So I just want to put the word contingency into its historical context here uh, and um, uh, mention Stephen Jay Gould, who really popularized the use of this uh, word um, here where he pointed, he, he said, uh, replaying the tape of life from some point in the distant past would yield a living world far different from the one we see today. Accidents and happenstance shape the course of evolution. So this is, this is um, a, been a very controversial statement and his uh, contemporary, uh, Simon Conway Morris, had uh, a nearly opposite point of view. Natural selection constrains, or, constrains organisms to a relatively few highly adaptive option options despite the vagaries of history, so that the evolutionary roots are many, but the destinations are limited. Evolution is broadly repeatable, and multiple replays would reveal striking similarities in important features, with contingency mostly confined to the minor details. So we have these two opposite views, and this uh, word contingency in this context has um, engendered an awful lot of uh, interesting back and forth discussion and uh, debate. Um, so, but I, I want to try to move the thinking to um, a, a little, to uh, say a more um, molecular, cellular level and, um, and talk about um, how we might do that by just uh, sort of shifting the time scale, really. Um, so um, if you uh, think of these uh, contingencies as uh, bad things that can happen, so you, uh, you and they can happen on different time scales. They can happen over a day when you suddenly uh, get tempted by uh, a bunch of donuts and now your glucose level starts to soar and you have to deal with that contingency. Um, or uh, there's even, there's, there's more, so there's these moment to moment contingencies that exist that the, pe that the body and cells have to be prepared for. But, uh, but contingencies, uh, the way Stephen Jay Gould thought about it, was on a much larger time scale. It's things like a meteor uh, striking the earth and wiping out the dinosaurs. So these, uh, this, this, this time scale for these bad things that can happen um, varies a lot. And uh, the cells have to be, organisms have to, in some sense, be prepared for them. Um, even though they can happen over very, very different time scales. And um, so, um, uh, so we, what I want to talk about today is sort of the preparedness for uh, uh, contingencies. And um, that's what we'll start to work our way toward. Um, so this, this problem of constancy and change in the face of contingency. So here this is, uh, um, yeah, I mentioned that the introduction, this evolutionary time scales, and the words for these two views are really uh, genetic drift, which means these random events that happen over long time scales uh, versus natural selection. But we're going to be talking down here, more of the time scales of, say, the lifespan of a cell. And uh, so cells, most cells really, um, have to uh, maintain their identities throughout the lifespan of the organism. Uh, you can have a skin cell suddenly changing into a liver cell. Um, uh, but some cells have to change their identity, especially uh, during development when um, you have uh, the embryo and it's now dividing, the cells are dividing, and using the very same genome over generations and generations of cells, the cells acquire different identities. And this is really a very interesting and fundamental problem in biology. That is, how is it that with the same genome, cells acquire such a diversity of phenotypes? So, um, 
so this is uh, this is the path that we'll talk about, and we'll talk about both limbs of this path because they're very much related, and they are. Um, and, and, and what happens to cells during, along these paths, um, in the face of various uh, uh, bad things that can happen to cells, is, is, is also uh, one of the themes I want to try to touch on. So, um, so here's here's this is um, just a very uh, generic look at cells dividing here. Um, cells uh, divide in this uh, binary fashion. Uh, probably because DNA has just two strands. And, um, uh, and, the, uh, and, and we have these words in which uh, we, you know, that, uh, we're starting with a single uh, cell that's pluripotent. That means it has the potential to be any cell in the body. And then uh, gradually through these cell divisions, its potential becomes more restricted. And uh, that's called uh, multipotent. So for instance, uh, the pluripotent cells, as I said, can give rise to any cell in the body, but a multipotent cell might only be, give, may only be able to give rise to, say, a hematopoietic lineage, that is just different types of blood cells. Um, and uh, then uh, cells cross this line. And below this line, we call this uh, terminal differentiation. That means the cells now stop dividing, and they've reached the point at, at which they are um, destined, to use the word loosely. It's just that this is the, the point where they have uh, acquired some sort of terminal identity and function. And, um, uh, but it doesn't mean that, uh, that change in their phenotype is over. Uh, there are still things that can happen to them. So, and this is where, and, and many of these happen, the, many of these changes that can happen at this stage happen when there are, uh, they, they do encounter uh, contingencies. So there are extreme options that terminally differentiated cells can now undertake to uh, deal with, with contingencies. So uh, one of them is to start proliferating again, and that's cancer. That could happen, say, in the face of radiation exposure. Um, sometimes cells will uh, commit suicide, called apoptosis. Uh, also, uh, that will happen under conditions in which maybe there's restricted blood supply. Um, and then there's this sort of very interesting um, thing that happens sometimes called transdifferentiation, in which a cell, this can happen sometimes in the vasculature, where a cell, uh, without really undergoing division, will simply change its identity. This happens in diabetes, for instance, where the smooth muscle cells within the vascular wall can shift their identity as the disease progresses to an endothelial cell. So this is, and that's called transdifferentiation. Um, and if you add up all these types of cells, now and we're, most of what I'm going to be talking about today, almost all of it is in, I'm talking about mammals for the most part, humans. If you add up all these uh, different cells here, uh, the, there are probably hundreds of terminally differentiated cells if you read the textbooks. But I don't know um, if that's true or not, because uh, there, you know, there's um, 100 billion cells in the brain, for instance, and uh, uh, we sometimes lump a lot of them together. But should they be lumped together? I, I think it's still an open question is how different is uh, one cell from the cell next to it, uh, you know, really in a very fundamental way. But in a textbook sense, um, there, the numbers of cells come to the hundreds. You know, there are like probably 20 different cells in the liver that can be identified uh, microscopically. And then there are uh, uh, probably a separate group of cells that are the precursor cells for these terminally differentiated cells. So if you add up all the numbers, we're, we're talking about you know, something in this range if you accept certain assumptions about what is a, a cell and its identity. Um, so this is the job of the organism, to generate all of this. And, um, and then, so while the cell is, uh, so, so there's this, concept that's been around for a long, long time, from the time of Claude Bernard, that as uh, cells are, uh, let's, and we're talking now mostly about terminally differentiated cells for a moment, uh, as cells are um, uh, encountering various problems in the environment, uh, they, uh, uh, Claude Bernard claimed that they uh, have, uh, uh, that, that they're homeostatic, that they will preserve constant the conditions of the internal environment. And, um, but, 
he's, um, he's probably wrong. I think a more accurate way of saying it is this term that has modified his thinking uh, a little bit called allostasis instead of homeostasis, which is more related to stability through change. So that is that the cell has to, rem the skin cell has to remain a skin cell, but all the uh, components of the cell are uh, changing depending on the conditions that the cell encounters. So you, if you are uh, out in the sun for a long period of time, then those skin cells are going to be uh, activating different genes and uh, may, may be activating DNA repair uh, uh, genes to actually repair the radiation-induced damage to DNA. So uh, the parameters are not constant, and the variation anticipates the demand and, and can possibly reduce error. Um, so. So what, before I just get to that next slide, I just um, so what I mentioned here was there are all, that these parameters are changing. Well, I, let me now elaborate on that word because the parameters that I'm referring to is basically the molecular inventory of the cell. What are all these parameters? What 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 are the things that cells can change to respond to contingencies? So I'm just going to in the next slide here I'm going to just list in the most global way. Uh, uh, them in this very broad, broad way that uh, humans have about somewhere between 20 and 25,000 genes. Uh, it's the number of these individual elements. Um, and uh, the, they, there's only uh, one, uh, there's, only, there's, only, there's only one gene for every gene has, is one gene. That's, that's, it's, a, it's a tautology in a sense. So the total individual elements are 25,000 and the copy number distribution would be flat. We'll come back to epigenetic marks in a moment. Now, so the genes are the DNA. It's going to be transcribed into RNA. And there are, that's the transcriptome. There are lots of different kinds of RNAs. But the RNAs uh, that are encoding proteins are the messenger RNAs. And um, so there are, um, so even though every gene then gets transcribed to an mRNA, uh, there are more mRNAs than genes because mRNAs are undergoing splicing. And they're, so they're changing. The products are changing a lot. So this is very much an estimate, maybe 10 to the fourth uh, mRNAs. And each of those mRNAs is present in a certain number of copies. So uh, this, is, this is, again, another number that's in the literature, that uh, something to 300 to 500,000 uh, copies total of uh, all the mRNAs. And I'm going to talk a bit later on about another uh, category in the transcriptome called microRNAs. Now, the mRNAs are making proteins, and the proteins are then going to change. They're going to get phosphorylated, and they're going to get modified. They're going to get glycosylated. There's all kinds of change. So it's said that in a cell, there may be as many as a billion different proteins. So, uh, and the distribution of all of these um, it has, uh, is not really clear. It has a, an exponential distribution. And I'll just show you the little bit of data that I'm aware of on this. Um, so this is an older paper from Rick Young at the Whitehead where he um, measured the copies of mRNAs. Um, and, um, and, 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 now, so this is, and this is back, by the way, this is in a yeast cell. So one of the very few slides I'm going to show that is in a unicellular organism. So the number of genes in the yeast cell is uh, about 5,000 or so. And if you look for how many copies of mRNAs all those genes are making, it has a distribution like this. So that basically, uh, there, most of the mRNAs are present in very low copy number. And there's a few that are quite abundant. And, and these kinds of curves are actually uh, probably true uh, throughout biology in, with regard to the mRNAs and probably other, many other molecular categories as well. So that, and here the curve is flipped, but this is a little bit of work that we just completed from um, this uh, transcriptome in the sponge actually, in which now instead of 5,000 genes, there's 21,000 uh, transcripts. Um, and uh, so as I say, many, uh, th this is still, uh, uh, we're not looking as much at splicing. Sponges have about uh, 15 to 20,000 genes, and most, and we can identify a lot of them. Uh, and uh, again, uh, a small number of abundant ones, and many uh, present at very uh, at low abundance. These are the distributions that are seen for um, many molecules. 
I'm saying this by way of background so that, so that what we're going to talk about next can be thought about in this, in this context of what is the molecular inventory and what are the, dis the abundance distribution that the cell has at its disposal to handle contingencies. So now let's uh, take another step toward how uh, cells are changing their identities. So one is differentiation. Differentiation is uh, something that uh, I'm sure you're familiar with. You know, cells are basically getting exposed to growth factors along gradients, and that is beginning to change cells so that uh, they differentiate in that lineage tree that I showed you earlier with precursor cells and differentiated cells. What we now know just in the last uh, few years is that it's possible to take a terminally differentiated cell and put in what are called these core pluripotency factors. These are the transcription factors that characterize pluripotent stem cells to introduce them into a terminally differentiated cell and drive the arrow back the other way. That's called reprogramming. And uh, there's a you know, great amount of enthusiasm in biology for um, reprogramming. It's thought that you know, this allows us to uh, circumvent the need for uh, fetal embryonic uh, stem cells, and we can make stem cells from, from anybody, and that's definitely uh, true. Um, so this has been a lot of enthusiasm about this, but whether or not uh, all of this sort of uh, new biology is going to result in any kind of uh, clinical application for people is, is still unknown. But one thing we do know, one thing that has absolutely been crystal clear from the reprogramming data. And that is that the, the 900 pound gorilla, the big guy in the cell for driving identity change are these uh, transcription factors. That is these proteins that will bind to the promoters on genes and turn them on and off. And, um, and, that, and because you can drive identity through reprogramming with just a single set, uh, say these four transcription factors, that has really uh, driven home this concept very, very clearly. So this is, uh, these are, transcription factors are the identity drivers. Now, um, so if those are the identity uh, drivers, let's now begin to talk about what's, uh, how we actually get specific cell identities because the, the, the transcription factors are a very, uh, they're, 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 they're just a, they're a very big hammer, and they don't really allow for the precision that's actually required. So I'm going to talk about two leading ideas for where the precision comes from to acquire cell identity. And um, one of them is going to be uh, one of them is work that's not from our lab at all. It's from a couple of papers that have come out of the Broad Institute on um, a chromatin state, which we'll talk about first. And then we'll talk about some work from my lab on microRNAs. These are two categories of uh, transcripts, uh, categories of, of, of the molecular inventory that will allow gene expression to become um, refined uh, and uh, lead to specific cell identities. So let's talk about chromatin state first. So this is the, the as you know, the DNA is in the nucleus. It's all wound up together and compacted in interesting ways. And the uh, compaction of uh, the DNA brings uh, pieces that in a linear sense are very far away and folds them together so they're near each other. And the way the DNA is all folded together um, is, um, is the, the organizer for this compaction uh, are, um, th there's, there's several uh, uh, proteins that do that and other modifications of the DNA, but the one that's discussed the most and the one that we know the most about are uh, histones. These are proteins that bind to the DNA and will uh, induce this type of compaction. And histones, there's an entire, what's called a histone code because the histones can be modified in a lot of different ways. These are the technical names for them. And just, uh, you know, they, uh, uh, for instance, um, H is a histone and K stands for a lysine. So this is lysine number four and it means it is uh, methylated. So you can modify histones in these different ways and then look at where these modified histones are attaching to the DNA. And um, when you do that, you get these kinds of uh, pictures. 
And this is done with a technique that's called chip seek. So let me just tell you about what this technique is. It's really, it's, it's an incredibly interesting technique. Um, but the, the histones are binding to the DNA in very specific places, especially these modified histones. So you have a cell and you want to see where all those specific histones are. Now, so what you do is you basically will uh, take the cell, uh, extract the DNA, chop up the DNA, and immunoprecipitate the, uh, the histone with an antibody that's very specific for the particular histone you want to look at. And now the fragments of DNA that are um, attached to a specific histone come down with this antibody and they precipitate at the bottom of the tube. Now you take that pellet and you throw it in this sequencer, the, uh, you know, one of these uh, next generation uh, massively parallel sequencers, which we have here on the campus. And, um, and what you can do is you now generate massive amounts of sequence and you see all the sequences that are present in that immunoprecipitation, all the DNA sequences that are associated with that particular histone modification. So I'm going to talk about just two histone modifications. One is that lysine 4 methylated, another is a lysine 27 methylated. And, sh and what, what is shown here are tracks in which the height of the bars indicates the number of times the instrument read that sequence, which means there's a lot, this is, so there's a lot right here for this particular histone. This particular sequence of DNA had many reads and it's generated a lot of that fragment, which means that that histone is bound right there and to all these other places. You can pretty much ignore this track. This is basically just an older technique that is showing that the newer technique, CHEP-seq, uh, is very, very similar to what we already knew. So if you look at this here, there's, these are the marks for where the histone is bound. These are the genes along here to which it's bound. And you can see that, uh, and these are embryonic stem cells, by the way, from a mouse. And we know a little bit about what these histones will do. So for instance, this one, the lysine 4-methyl, will is associated with genes that are getting activated. Whereas the one that has lysine 27 tends to be associated with genes that are being silenced. So um, I want to introduce two terms. One is what might be called a monovalent promoter. That means there's just one histone attached to it. So uh, you might say something like that. Here is uh, lysine 4 but down here you don't see any of the lysine 27, monovalent. And then there's a bivalent chromatin mark where you have both types of histones attached to the same gene. You have an activator and a silencer on the very same gene. This pattern is really common in embryonic stem cells. These are genes that can't make up their mind. They're just poised there, ready to go, one way or the other, to either get turned on or turned off. And this particular state of bivalent chromatin marks or a poised gene is very typical of this pluripotent state, which is just, uh, in a sense, um, just waiting for something to happen to undergo the expression of a specific set of these uh, genes. Now. So here again, um, this is a, a little bit similar, uh, but now I'm, not, now I'm showing you, here's the stem cell track. And once again, you're seeing these bivalent types of promoters in front of genes. These are names of genes. And these are the reads that come from these fragments of DNA. But now the pluripotent stem cell is going to resolve the ambivalence of having a silencer and an activator on it as it begins to differentiate. So, this is, this, these letters, NPC stands for neural precursor cell. So the, the stem cell now, pluripotent stem cell, goes to a multipotent cell in which it can now become a neural precursor cell. And it has resolved this problem. It's now going to activate a gene that is a neural transcription factor, the very gene it should activate if it ultimately wants to become a neuron. And, um, and, and there are many examples of this uh, for cells that are in neuronal lineages over here, and those are that are in what we call mesenchymal lineages over here. That is coming from the middle germ layer and will be things like fat tissue, for instance. So now 
these different histone marks, we also know what types of elements they bind to in the genome. The genome has not just genes, but it has, uh, this might be a gene here, but it has these promoter regions. And then there are these things called enhancers and insulators. And these insulators will set up the, these general boundaries and enhancers, which can be very far away from the gene, will modify whether or not the promoter is going to turn on the gene or not. So, uh, so here are some of these, modif these, uh, these modifiers, and histones also combine to enhancer elements, they bind to promoter elements, they combine to insulators, they combine to all of these different elements in the gene. And if you look at these uh, combinations uh, of the marks here, you can uh, see that once again they're, they're, they, they bind to all of them. But uh, there's a particularly interesting binding pattern when it comes to the enhancers. And, um, and this is work, as I said, this is not our work. This is work from uh, a paper um, uh, uh, that came out at the Broad Institute uh, very, recent, very, very recently. And uh, so if you look at these patterns in which the um, uh, histones are binding to uh, enhancer elements or promoter elements, it turns out here, these are the cell types along the top. They've, uh, they looked at what it's at, about seven or eight different cell types. And, uh, yeah, and, and you can see this set of patterns that, and these are the, the genes that are being, uh, that, that, the, uh, that particular histones are binding to. And what is revealed here is, is that the pattern of which hist the modified histones are binding to enhancers, it uh, appears, at least with this small gene set, to allow us to predict the specificity of the, of the phenotype. That is what the cell identity uh, is. So enhancers, you know, the, the, the promoters are turning on the transcription factors, which as I said are the big guns that are driving the change. But the enhancers seem to be more closely aligned with telling us what the actual identity of the cell is. Okay, so now I want to just move to another category which seems almost equally good for revealing specific cell identities. And uh, now I want to uh, uh, introduce uh, microRNAs, which is something that my lab does work on quite a bit. And um, so let me define them first. They were uh, discovered only relatively recently. Um, they were discovered in 1993 by Victor Ambrose um, uh, in the worm. Uh, but the field, the, the whole area of these microRNAs, these very small non-coding transcripts of just about 21 nucleotides, it lay dormant for almost uh, nine or 10 years until after the year, until about 2002 or 2001 when uh, for the first time, people realized that these particu this particular category of transcripts were not just a weird thing that happens in worms, but actually they are seen all through biology. And this finding was uh, by Gary Rufkin when he actually found that they were much more widespread than uh, just in worms. So they, what they do is they will bind to the untranslated regions of these target messenger RNAs. So remember, the messenger RNAs are the transcripts for the coding regions. And um, now what you have is you have this whole system. There's about 1,000 of these microRNAs which are determining whether an mRNA is going to be translated or not. That is, and it's happening in the cytoplasm, not the nucleus. That is, these small RNAs are binding to the mRNAs out in the cytoplasm. So what do you have? You have a system now that has, a, there's about a thousand transcription factors too. So you have a, a system of cytoplasmic regulators which has a complexity that's comparable uh, to the transcription factors. You have a, a, a complex system in the cytoplasm which is determining whether an mRNA is translated or not, and you have a complex system in the nucleus uh, of promoters and enhancers that are determining whether a gene is actually going to be expressed or not, whether it's going to be transcribed, turned on. So. Um, so this, this is the set of microRNAs, small, um, small RNAs that can um, inhibit translation of an mRNA. Again, by way of background, uh, microRNAs, even though they're just 21 nucleotides, they're encoded in the genome, just like protein coding genes. They're transcribed into these uh, primary transcripts in the nucleus. Uh, they form these stem loop structures that then will move through the cytoplasm. Uh, I'm sorry, they form these stem loop structures and then there's an enzyme that clips off the stem 
and leaves uh, just this hairpin structure, and then it moves out into the nucleus. In the nucleus, there's another enzyme called dicer that clips off this loop, and now when it's now now it's double stranded, and one strand goes and finds a target mRNA to bind to in a Watson-Crick uh, base pairing manner. And once this happens now, the microRNA can do one of two things. It can either impair its translation or it can destroy the mRNA. So this is just a very quick look at how a, micro, a microRNA biogenesis leading up to, what it, to its control over this mRNA. So I said there's about 1,000 microRNAs. Each one of those microRNAs, because it, you, see how, you see how this is drawn? There's some mismatches in the base pairing. MicroRNAs imperfectly bind to their target mRNAs. So because there's this slack, there's a, that there's a, a loss of the constraint of precise Watson-Crick base pairing. It means that every microRNA can have up to 300 different targets. There are about each microRNA can bind to potentially 300 different mRNAs. And it's said that about two-thirds of the genome, two-thirds of the mRNAs are targeted by uh, microRNAs. So, um, and this is just one more look at it because after it gets cut and this uh, stem loop structure moves into the cytoplasm, this is what it looks like in a little higher power here. Here's the loop region. The loop region is getting cut off by an enzyme and leaving, and then these strands separate and it leaves this mature microRNA shown in, this, in, the, in the shaded area here to bind to a target mRNA. Now, the reason I just showed this is I want to just also show um, how you can spot these things, because they're really small. They're really, and uh, in fact, the reason they were probably missed for so long is when you run these gels for RNAs, they'll just, uh, people just, they, they either run off the gel or people didn't look at the bottom, and they've just, it's been a real curiosity how molecular biologists missed microRNAs for so many years. Um, the biochemically oriented uh, um, biologists did not see them. It took the geneticists to see them. So. And the reason I wanted to show that shape was here because if you go into uh, University of California Santa Cruz browser and you start to look around for some of your favorite genes, and mine are generally microRNAs, the, uh, here is an alignment of all of these genes. And uh, mouse, rat, rabbit, dog, armadillo, they're all lined up here. And then the height of these blue bars indicates the degree of conservation. And what you can see here is the characteristic look in the browser, the UC browser, for uh, a microRNA. It has a, a certain length, but it, they almost always have a little notch right there where the, where the conservation goes down because the constraints over this loop region are much less. And you, so you can see, in terms of evolution, the RNA structure. The other way to look at a microRNA is when we throw them into the sequencer and we do this, uh, you know, this very uh, high throughput sequencing. And now we can look at all, this, all of these, these uh, strands that come out uh, of the sequencer and align them to the genome. This is the genome down here. And these are the fragments that come out. And we align them to the, to the bases. And we can see here, again, in the alignments, the stem loop structure. This is that shaded area, the mature micro, microRNA, where you get all these counts. The loop is cut off, and you can't find it at all in the sequencer. And the other strand, which has a slightly slower degradation kinetics, is still around in small amounts. So this is the characteristic signature of a microRNA by deep sequencing. Now, let's talk about how microRNAs are interesting with regard to the original questions that I was posing here. That is acquiring cell identity and facing contingencies. So we're going to talk about two things. Uh, here two functions of microRNA at a systems level, uh, feedback loops and distributed network effects. And um, the feedback loops that are most commonly described so far uh, are these. That is, that the microRNA has this very interesting relationship to transcription factors. That is, the, uh, um, a transcription factor um, is encoded by an mRNA, that, uh, and that mRNA can be um, inhibited by a microRNA. But if it's not inhibited, it goes on to make a protein, and that protein can then go and bind sometimes to the promoter of the microRNA and have this, these different, different types of feedback loops. 
And there are many of these now emerging. There, there are many of them. There's probably, in, in, uh, in worm, there's about 23 described. I don't even think we know how many there are in humans. Here are, the first one that was actually described experimentally was done by Oliver Hobart at Columbia, where he found that uh, through a feedback mechanism here of a microRNA called MIR273, he was able to show that uh, cells acquired two particular cells became different with regard to whether they were on the right or left side of the worm. And, um, the, and, and then we showed that uh, here that when a cell exits from pluripotency, that is now it's a stem cell and it's going to decide to move out and undergo differentiation, that, uh, that microRNA-145 will inhibit these core transcription factors. I, I think I mentioned them briefly before, OC4, SOX2, KLF4. And those, interestingly, and one of them now can loop around and inhibit the promoter on MIR145. So once again, we have another example of a uh, double negative feedback loop and um, giving rise to a model like this where you have these human embryonic stem cells and at uh, uh, some point MIR145, is, uh, its expression is getting up to some critical point where there's a switch in... Um, because it's a double negative feedback loop, we may have bistability. And at that point, we can actually uh, see that the cells begin to differentiate into at least two of the three germ layers, mesoderm and ectoderm. So MIR-145 and these core transcription factors exist in this double negative feedback loop. And in collaboration now uh, with Gabriele Liacci and Mustafa Kamash, we're actually seeing if by experimentally manipulating these levels, we can actually induce uh, a bistable bi state. Now, so here is, uh, this is very similar to something I've already showed you, but it's got names on it in terms of looking at lineages. Here's once again that pluripotent stem cell, and as you're going down these pathways, you're getting into multipotent cells and finally terminal differentiation. The point of showing you this is, is that at each of these decision nodes, where a pluripotent cell now becomes, uh, say, a mesoderm, or ultimately where it's going to become blood cells along this lineage. At each of these decision nodes, there are microRNAs that are getting turned on and turned off. And they seem to be very important in making these changes in identity during differentiation. And in fact, in work, again, this is work that we did not do. I'm sorry, I forgot to put down the reference. It's by uh, Todd Golub, um, also at the Broad, who, um, who looked at microRNA profiles in cancer cells. And here, once again, uh, what this complicated uh, heat map is actually showing is, is that the profile of a microRNA allows you to actually, uh, is better than histology. It's better than, say, taking a biopsy and looking under the microscope to identify what type of tumor it is. The actually, the, the microRNA profile can tell you the specific uh, type of, of subtype of tumor. Is it, uh, you know, not only is it a breast tumor or a pancreatic tumor, but is it, uh, is it have a certain other characteristics and may it be even be responsive to certain medications? So um, microRNA profiles can actually resolve subtypes of cancer and perhaps even give us a clue about the um, uh, vulnerability to treatment. Okay. Now, um, we also did profiling on a lot of uh, different uh, cells, and uh, here in uh, work done by uh, uh, Pierre Neveu, who um, also has worked closely with Boris uh, Schreiman, who's helped us with this. Um, we um, developed um, what we call a mirror map, in which uh, it turns out that if you uh, profile lots and lots of different cells, a lot of different stem cells made in different ways and cancer cells and differentiated cells. And you just take all those profiles and then you, uh, in a very non-biased way with using principal component analysis or some other techniques, we can actually show that they fall into these very discrete clusters. And um, the, so you have a cancer cluster based on the microRNA profile, there's a differentiated cell cluster. And what caught our eye was is that pluripotent stem cells are not monolithic. That's what was thought before. That is, they're not a single, a, they're not a singularity. They're not just, well, they're, not, they're not one thing. They fall into two very discrete groups uh, with a clear boundary, and they are really, um, and, and, they, um, and, 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 they, and they separate in a very interesting way. They separate here in that one group 
seems to have microRNAs that are a little more characteristic of cancer. This, this axis here is basically microRNAs that are increased in pluripotent cells. So th that's why these get separated from these. But why are these getting separated from these? Well, these microRNAs in these stem cells are, are, have many of them that are uh, similar to cancer cells. And these are stem cells that have many that are more similar to microRNAs seen in differentiated cells. So you might say, if I'm in line now for a stem cell uh, transplant for some problem that you may have, like you want to you know, replace your pancreas for diabetes or something, you might say, well, can you give me the stem cells that are over in this category? Because I don't, I'm really afraid that they're going to become, this, the stem cells could become cancer. This is a big worry in stem cell biology as to, uh, are we treating people uh, with stem cells but also giving them cancer? And I would say that, you know, not so fast because um, while uh, these stem cells, and we don't know the answer to this yet, these stem, these stem cells may be predisposed to f form cancer. These particular stem cells may be predisposed to premature aging. So take your pick. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so, this, uh, so these two categories were a surprise, and the thing, another surprise that fell out of this, was that um, actually the um, this 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 gene called p53, which is a really good marker for uh, cancer, uh, also was uh, different between here and here. P53 is involved in a lot of things that sort of will uh, prevent cancer, it's like a, t it's a tumor suppressor, so that when p53 goes down here, you're more likely to have uh, cancer. The gene that is most commonly mutated in cancer is p53. And uh, so here is, uh, so, so here it's lower, and what was interesting about this is that p53 has many microRNA targets. And uh, so, we have here the idea, perhaps, uh, why is it that some uh, RNAs are regulated by microRNAs and some are not? Well, it may be, you know, when, when, you, when you put a microRNA into a cell and you express it artificially, it can change the protein levels of the targets, but not by very much. It makes these small changes, and no one has really understood that. But perhaps uh, it, the genes that tend to be targeted are many genes that are operating near their thresholds. So that all you want to do is make a small adjust, adjustment. The cell has set up a range of expression for every single protein. And for some proteins, it can probably tolerate a lot more uh, room in its expression range. But there must be other proteins that are operating so close to toxicity. What kind of toxicity am I talking about? Well, the most common one would be aggregation. That is, protein proteins, when they get to be too concentrated, will self-assemble and begin to aggregate. This is one of the problems in Alzheimer's, for instance. I said I wasn't going to mention that. So, uh, but, the, uh, but here, um, so this is, that's just an idea, that microRNA uh, suppression may be uh, targeting those uh, particular transcripts that have to uh, have their function near their threshold levels. Okay, now uh, I want to talk about an another role for microRNAs, which is in controlling networks of genes. And um, this is now another theme that, that we've developed and other labs have developed that is a particular microRNA, let's give an example here of MIR-21, um, will target, have many targets, I already mentioned that, but when a microRNA has multiple targets, those particular targets are often functionally related. And so in this case, microRNA, which is very, very commonly elevated in cancers. Over and over again, you see it to very high levels. So high that it's beginning to be used as a blood test for picking up uh, cancers. And uh, so it inhibits all of these different genes. And these genes are in pathways that are all leading down to the two big pillars of cancer biology. That is uh, the proliferation, cell cycle arrest or cell cycle uh, uh, lack of control over the cell cycle and apoptosis. This is really what happens. These two pathways are the fundamental part of cancer. That is, cells are out of control in a proliferative way, but they're also not undergoing apoptosis as they should. So when there's dysfunction in these two very related pathways, then um, uh, you get cancer. And MIR-21 seems to target a lot of these genes all through these networks. Here's another example of another one that we recently discovered. Um, this one's MIR-28. There's a pathway in which uh, there's a receptor on the cell 
that is a kinase. Kinase means a, an enzyme that's going to phosphorylate other uh, proteins. And this, these particular categories of, of, of uh, kinases will phosphorylate proteins on a tyrosine. So they're tyrosine kinases. And tyrosine kinases are, again, bad guys in cancer. So here we have another microRNA that's phosphorylating, that's inhibiting many of the genes involved in a pathway involved in uh, tyrosine phosphorylation that is also leading to proliferation. So this leads us to the idea that um, uh, one, that microRNAs can regulate gene expression additively, that is multiple microRNAs combined to a three prime UTR and grade its expression. Uh, and that can be a switch. Uh, it can make small changes in protein levels, but most importantly is, is that I think the lesson here is, is that the way to manipulate the way nature manipulates a network is not the way the pharmaceutical industry manipulates a network. What, they, what, what the pharmaceutical industry likes to do is say, where's the common pathway? Where's the one gene that's down at the, the, the final common pathway and to find a drug and go after it and kill it? But nature's too smart. It always seems to find a way around it. The way nature seems to inhibit pathways is to blanket the entire network in a very subtle way to perhaps, and this is speculation, change the output. And that seems to be another uh, a function for microRNAs. So I think um, I'm just going to go very quickly through this one. This is one more example of a network. This one is not from our lab. This is from Richard Carthew's lab, where, again, he can find that uh, uh, this time a microRNA in fly will, uh, again, affect uh, a network which is actually a double negative feedback loop here involving a transcription factor and a microRNA that's involved in the uh, determination of fly sensory organs. That means that it's uh, the precursor cells that are going to end up being the fly eye or uh, the antenna, other sensory organs. And what's happening here, actually, is, is that this is another incredibly interesting feature of microRNAs. If you knock out MIR7, even though it's very much involved in these networks, it has very little effect. And this has been a problem that we've seen over and over again. When you knock out individual microRNAs, even though they seem to be in these critically important pathways, and like MIR7, it's conserved from analid to human. And if it's conserved, that means it's probably important. But if you knock it out, you don't see any phenotype. Okay, now we're working our way back to contingencies. So what Richard Carthew did in his lab, very interesting experiment, was now to actually look at the effect of MIR7 knockout when he changes the temperature in which the animal has to live during development. And, it's, and so that, again, there's very little effect in these wild-type larvae with no knockout and no effect in the expression of these key transcription factors. But once there's the MIR-7 mutant, now he sees effects over the transcription factors and a phenotype. So the microRNA seems to be controlling for a contingency that can arise if temperature becomes dysregulated. So um, I'm going to just, uh, I'm, I'm working my way toward uh, the final part of this, which I, I want to sum up this idea here that I just talked about, which is, is that um, the, uh, um, oops, I just forgot to turn off my cell phone. That's bad. <laughs> uh, the, uh, let me just turn that off. Sorry about that. Um, and um, so, I mentioned how transcription factors are the big guns. They're changing cell A to cell B. And yet, there's this, contra there's this somewhat counterintuitive problem that the microRNA profiles, while they don't cause the change, they are very highly associated with the uh, identity of, in of these cells. This profile fits cell A. This profile fits, fits cell B. But no microRNA can actually induce this change. So. Here's the same thing again, that transcription factors are changing the cell identity. And the idea here, the speculation is, is, is that the, here's a, a cell in a particular state, and it's, say, a differentiated cell. And depending on the conditions that it encounters, that is, changes in temperature, low glucose, it's going to alter in some allostatic way the uh, number of uh, transcripts that it has. And it does all that without changing its identity. It's changing all of its components, all the parameters, but it still has this, it's still the same cell it was at the beginning. And then 
something and, and, and so that the idea here is, is that the microRNAs are maintaining these expression boundaries. And that when you cross the boundary, whether it's cancer or differentiation, then the cell phenotype actually changes. Okay. So um, and perhaps by creating the microRNAs, which are very easy to invent in the genome, I mean there are only these 21 nucleotide uh, transcripts that have to form a stem loop structure. That perhaps by uh, their you know, quasi-random formation in the genome, they allow us to enlarge the cellular uh, phenotypic repertoire. That is, they may be capacitators for the emergence of multiple cell types. Totally speculative comment. Okay, last few moments. Um, will we go one hour? Is that the? Yes. yes. So for the last few moments, I want to just switch to neurons and uh, talk about how um, neurons recruit the microRNA system for a very specialized role. And so why would we have these microRNAs in the first place? Well, why not just use more transcription factors? MicroRNAs have a more rapid rate of, uh, uh, their rapid rate of biogenesis is an advantage, and they can affect expression uh, without any delay. So, here, and neuronal firing is a contingency. If you're, whether or not your a particular neuron is going to fire is, uh, has some probability, and uh, not this one, but it has, uh, and it, um, and it depends on where you go. It's, uh, it's, you know, it depends on what you encounter. All of that is a contingency. If you decide to go to the opera instead of the art museum, you're firing different neurons. So it depends on chance contingencies in the environment, on free will. All of these things are going to affect which particular synapses are going to fire. So the idea of microRNAs controlling contingencies looks like it's very nice for working in neurons, perhaps. And so what is the stuff that is in these neurons in which this contingency system is operating? Well, it's synapses. And synapses, basically, you're familiar with what they look like. There's vesicles that release the neurotransmitter and stimulate a postsynaptic receptor. And uh, the same thing is shown over here. But the other thing that's shown here is that when this happens, when these trans transmitters go across, they will also activate local translation and turn on new proteins that allows the synapse to learn. And Here's a, a, a recent finding from our lab where the way we think that happens is, is that an impulse comes in to this uh, neuron uh, from the presynaptic side, and then here is um, this uh, mRNA transcript sitting up near the synapse, and it's being silenced by this microRNA, but when the synapse comes in, uh, and, and this whole duplex is being housed in a complex that's called an RNA inhibitory complex and or silencing complex, and uh, then, and part of this complex is a protein called MOV10. When the impulse comes in, MOV10 gets destroyed, it gets degraded, and now this mRNA begins to translate. So this is a system that we found which can actually now control the local translation by uh, uh, turning on and off a microRNA right at the synapse. And here's a whole layer of regulation that is just poised for the contingency of being of, of a neuron firing. It's just waiting there. And I'm going to skip this. This is just some of the actual data that backs up what I said. We don't have time to show it. This is done by um, uh, Surav Banerjee and Pierre Neveu. And um, and I, I just I'm going to finish up with these last few slides, which is to say, okay, these microRNAs are controlling this system out there at synapses. Well. Here they are. This is what's called in situ hybridization. We can look at specific microRNAs that's way out in these dendrites where the synapses are. And if we now use some uh, techniques by capturing using a laser some of these branches and then measuring the amount of a microRNA that's out there, uh, it turns out when we measure the entire cell, uh, the numbers of microRNAs, are generally, in a neuron, come to about 10 to the third. The highest ones might be 10 to the fourth. They're mostly in the range. The total number of microRNAs in a cell is about 10 to the third in a neuron. That is an extremely fascinating number because 10 to the third is also about the same number of synapses we have. So if you look at this, the microRNAs are pretty evenly distributed. That means that all those 10 to the third microRNAs are not in one synapse they're pretty uniformly distributed over all the synapses. That means the number of microRNAs in any single synapse is going to be in the single digits. And 
that um, so we basically w would imply that there's a certain stochasticity to whether or not the machinery to receive an impulse is going to either be there or not. So let's go on to the final thing I want to say. Relative to the number of synapses, neuronal firing is a relatively low frequency event. We have 100 billion neurons in the brain. Every single one of those neurons has about 5,000 synapses. There's, only, there's not that many that are firing for any particular thing we're doing. Most of them are just sitting there in reserve. So it's a, it's a very, the brain is a really high cost instrument. It's a very high cost of maintaining all this synaptic machinery available for low frequency contingencies. And uh, so, and this is just how expensive it is. The adult brain is 2% of the body weight, but it's using 20% of the body's energy. So perhaps one way around this is you can perhaps reduce the amount of machinery you keep at any single synapse by keeping the copy number low. So. You have the stochastic avail availability of, of the machinery. Here's the machinery. Here's the impulse. It didn't match up and nothing happened. But now, here's the machinery and here's a bunch of impulses coming in and this one worked. So now you can reduce, but not only can you reduce the resource requirements at each synapse, but perhaps some sort of coincidence detection may also help reduce noise. So finally, the last slide is to take this. What neuroscientists love to do is to go from the molecular level to the big picture, the whole brain. You know, neuroscientists generally have a, at my level, molecular guys, have a little bit of envy for the fMRI guys that are imaging all of the brain and trying to, making these pictures like this, which are so beautiful. So what, um, so what Marcus Reichel has discovered is, is that there's, uh, that the additional energy the brain expends for task-directed behavior is extremely small compared to the ongoing amount of energy that the brain continuously expends. That's another version of what I just said. It's just taking a lot of energy to keep all this stuff there, but only a small amount of it is being used. And when it is used, it only inc there's only an increment of a very small amount uh, of energy. So uh, 60 per to 80% of the brain energy budget is basal intrinsic activity. And the additional energy burden associated with momentary demands of the environment, the contingencies, is very small compared to the total energy uh, budget. So if you're doing absolutely nothing, you're just vegging somewhere and you're closing your eyes and you're not even listening to music or anything, you're just lying there, what the part of the brain that activates is called the default network and this is the pattern that it looks like. The brain is very active when you're doing nothing and as soon as you switch to a task, this pattern changes. The total energy you're using doesn't change very much, but the patterns change. So I would, I would like to think that at this scale now, we, have, we can go from some of those molecular requirements I described to how maybe uh, this overall picture of the brain is operating. So I thank you very much. I'll show you who the uh, people are involved here. Um, uh, people in my lab, Sarav, uh, did the work on the uh, MOV10. Talis, a lot of the work on cancer. Min Zhang on the single uh, microRNAs at synapses. Na Xu did the double negative feedback loops. Uh, and all of these people are involved in the sequencing. Um, then there's uh, Pierre Neveu, who I mentioned, works very closely with Boris. Uh, Gabriele works very closely with Mustafa, who helped me. And most recently, Danny Bissett uh, from Gene Carlson's lab has been helping us as well. Thank you very much. Yes. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, I actually don't know the answer to that. I don't know it, what the if for lysine 27 and lysine 4 whether or not there is a uh, at say the EM level if you can see a difference in the chromatin organization with either of those two mestones. I, I, I think it's probably known. I just don't know. <laughs> Convergence.
uh, suggested that the microRNAs were sort of transported, you know, kicked out of the nucleus, and they did their job in the, in the cytosol. Is there any role they might have in sustaining a, a, a structure of the chromatin in, 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 like inside the nucleus? So right. So there is uh, this minority school in the microRNA field that keeps searching for some nuclear role for microRNAs. And they are, um, uh, they don't go away, but, they're, but, but they have not really been widely endorsed. It's really hard to find micros of any numbers in the nucleus. And, um, you know, the, the last time I heard Phil Sharp talk, he just dogmatically said they're not there. <laughs> but, I, I, but I, on the other hand, I want this something we're looking for in our lab. I do think there's going to be some relationship between the enhancer elements and some class of small RNAs. Question. So are there any organisms which, um, any multi, I suppose you would like to say multi but are there organisms without like RNAs? Yeah, I would like you to say multicellular. If, if there are microRNAs in all multicellular organisms, is that the question? Uh, okay, so well, let's I, let me put the annoyance in there for you. The uh, so the reason perhaps you're expressing some reservation about using the word multicellular is that uh, you know single cell organisms can form these colonies and they start to look a lot like they have some cooperativity among them. The one, maybe that's why you're saying it. The way I'm using multicellular is not just that there are lots of cells, but the individual cells have specialized. That's got to be the critical thing. And when you have that phenomena happening, regardless of which biological kingdom it is, whether it's animals, plants, or algae, you have microRNAs. But you don't in the single cells. You do have some of the components of the pathway. There's things there, but there's no real bona fide microRNAs. So in my view, microRNAs are very closely linked to cell specialization in multicellular organisms. Thank you.